I want to talk about mindfulness. I want to contrast uh, the Buddhist notion of mindfulness and the Christian notion of mindfulness because I hear people talking about this. It's kind of a form of Buddhist meditation, so I want to submit to you that uh, there can certainly be a way of understanding this in a Christian sense, and I want to contrast them and explain what I mean. So uh, this is very fitting and appropriate at this time when we need this mindfulness uh, to become recollected and regain our calm, our focus, okay? Uh, Because these are crazy times we all know. Now, uh, Buddhist mindfulness is kind of like a therapeutic mental strategy, mental health strategy, kind of mental hygiene psychological health. People find it very beneficial, this practice of mindfulness. I can define it this way. It can be defined many ways, but basically awareness of the present moment, being present to the moment. Focusing on your breathing is most typical. Uh, You hear this. Focusing on your breathing and trying to think of nothing else emptying your mind of all ruminating thoughts and stressful thoughts. Just uh, focus on your breathing. The great Buddhist monk masters will often said, you know, just simply eat a raisin and think of nothing else but the taste and experience of eating a raisin. So I want you to go home and eat a raisin tonight and do that. Try that as an experiment. I can't see if you're laughing because you got the dang masks on. All right, but I hope you're laughing on your mask. I thought that was funny. Now, um, reduction of ruminating stressful thoughts. That is a very beneficial thing to do. We obsess. Obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, begins with this like obsessiveness. What is obsessive anyway? It comes from these Latin words, obsedere. It means literally to sit in front of something. Sedere, to sit. Ah, prepositional prefix in front of something and just stare at it. And you obsess about it, fixate on something, and uh, your anxiety builds and builds and builds because you're like, and it comes out sideways in all sorts of con- compulsive uh, behavior. Now, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so, what does mindfulness do? It kind of like detaches us from our our thoughts um, separates from us our thoughts and we kind of detach ourselves and let go of them and we kind of look at them objectively we stand apart from them and the Buddhist would say to look at them non-judgmentally and just kind of look and analyze and let them go you just kind of let your thoughts go from this vantage point of mindfulness and in doing so we remind ourselves of the three marks of existence, the Buddhists will call them, three marks of existence in the Buddhist worldview, in their tradition. These three marks of all existence. Impermanence is the first, that nothing is permanent. I'd say from a Christian point of view that uh, is problematic to say the least, I mean, Everything we say, do, don't say, do, is recorded down here. All our thoughts, it's like recorded in the mind of God, you know? He's got a VCR up there, and he's recording everything, and when we cross over to the other side, we're going to have a particular judgment, or what some people describe as a life review, and the whole thing flashes before you, okay? You hit the rewind button, you go back with the ghost of Christmas past, so to speak, and you have this experience, and people describe this, even agnostics have this life review experience or what we call a particular judgment, okay, it's recorded. And they hit the play button and you experience it in an incredibly profound way, all the feelings you had, all the feelings other people had, the way you influenced them, impacted them, positively and negatively, you experience it in this profound way. So I don't believe in this, business that uh, everything is impermanent down here. 
We are permanent. We are immortal beings. We have something within us that is not part of the physical universe, sets us apart from everything else in the physical universe because we're that type of being that has an immortal soul that is trans-physical, spiritual. That's an incredible, astounding fact about these types of beings, personal beings like us. We're part of the physical universe, yeah, but we also share something that's not part of the physical universe. Think about that. So awesome to contemplate the existence of the human soul. So that is something permanent and it goes with us. It does not die. When we die, it leaves our body, okay, but it is not subject to death or corruption. So uh, I'm sure there's more ways we can demonstrate this, this idea that we're just, you can't ever step in the same river twice. You know, everything's in flux and everything's changing. Heraclitus, ancient Greek philosophers thought of this stuff. Everything's impermanent, all right? Yeah, there's a certain sense we're in time and space in a temporal reality down here, okay? So there is a certain sense of impermanence about it, but I don't buy this particular mark of existence in the, from a Buddhist standpoint. Next, everything is like unsatisfactory down here. So it's fundamental thinking in Buddhist worldview, okay? Unsatisfactoriness. We're gonna never be satisfied we're gonna suffer. Nothing's gonna quite do it for us. I love the saying in Isaiah chapter 28, the bed's always too short to fully stretch oneself out on. The cover's too narrow to wrap oneself up in. You can't get snug as a bug in a rug. Down here, we're uncomfortable, we're restless, irritable, and discontent. Okay, uh, this is what Solomon experiences in the book of Ecclesiastes. He has this kind of like, moment and uh, where he realizes the unsatisfactoriness of all things and that's when he famously says you know vanity of vanity all is vanity okay there's nothing new under the sun and it's all the same thing and now our lord kind of there is something to that in a certain sense that we can find resonances in sacred scripture like isaiah 28 that there is yes there is Nothing created in the created order can do it for us. We are made for Almighty God. The only thing that can satisfy us, we're all like rockets. A rocket is meant to blast off into heaven back towards its creator. That's what we're made for. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, St. Augustine famously said in the fourth century. So when we chase our contentment and happiness down here in the created order with created things is like a rocket inverted into the ground, just driving into the ground. It's just frustration is what will happen. We'll be frustrated with the unsatisfactoriness of all things. So look, store up treasure in heaven, our Lord says, where there's no thief and there's no rust. All right. So... Good, I, I can work with that unsatisfactoriness, but now this third one I got a real problem with, one of the marks of existence from a Buddhist standpoint that we should dwell upon and be informed by as we experience this state of mindfulness. The impermanence of things, the unsatisfactoriness of all things, and then lastly, the non-self. That we do not exist ultimately, that we have no identity that we are not really separate. Our separateness and distinctness, our identity is an illusion. And mindfulness is meant to strip away all delusion so that we see the real picture is that we really don't have any real existence of our own. And nirvana is the final realization of that where we're dissolved, melt away, absorption into the all into the oneness of things, the great big amoeba of being, I guess. I don't know what it is, all right? But that is absolutely polar opposite of Christianity. God came down and divided and separated the water from the land and the sky and so on the day from the night. Okay, division in creation in the created order is good and blessed by Almighty God. Willed and intended by Him, we are separate beings with our own unique identity, like the proverbial snowflake. 
But I mean, it really, I know it's a little kid illustration, but it's absolutely true. Uh, we are completely unique. Every single one of us has a certain particularity, incommunicability even, is a fancy philosophical word to describe this radical identity that each one of us possesses, given to us by Almighty God, that we will retain for all eternity. We will be fully realized in heaven in our identity. So I absolutely reject this notion of the non-self. Okay, so it starts sounding good at first. Oh yeah, I like this Buddhist mindfulness. This is so wonderful to calm my spirit and just focus on my breathing, that physical act of breathing. Yeah, it's a technique and uh, it's fine to a point, um, but ultimately it's got some real problems. Read G.K. Chesterton, okay, he really doesn't pull any punches on this. These Eastern philosophies are very different from Christianity and we need to make sure we don't confuse that distinction between these two things. Because for them, freedom from delusion and this path of liberation that they're on towards this nirvana experience of absorption into the all and self-annihilation in the oneness of all being or whatever. Okay. That is not enlightenment, folks. God doesn't want us to be destroyed. He loves us. He gave us our particular particularity and identity uh, and blessed it. Uh, he doesn't want us to annihilate ourselves. That's not enlightenment, okay? That is darkness, okay? The end that they're striving for is something that is really sad and leads me to a feeling of emptiness and despair that, uh, wow, I found a person who committed suicide one time and uh, it was a terrible thing. I was alone and I received a note and I went and found them. And I'm not gonna go into any detail, but there was a Buddha statue right there. And I, that made a real impression on me. Not that every Buddhist is gonna be driven to suicide, but I'm telling you there's something fundamentally pessimistic about this whole worldview. It's a human philosophy contrived by men to deal with the problem of evil and suffering in the world. And mindfulness, it all sounds wonderful, but uh, we just gotta be on guard as we expose ourselves to these things. People in the West get fascinated by these things. I'm gonna shed the baggage of all my Christian beliefs and, um, you know, kind of dabble in these, you know, a little, little, um, these things sound so deep and esoteric, all is one, and college kids smoke pot and think about these things in their dorm room, and oh yeah, man, dude, you know what, I think it's, I really think it's all one. Don't you just feel it, man? I mean, I'm one. All right, I'll stop. All right, now, uh, let's talk about hope. Let's talk about Christian mindfulness, something really positive and good. This is so awesome, and it relates to the readings today that's made me think of this whole thing. Here's Christian mindfulness in a nutshell. St. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. The mind of the divine Logos, the one who is, calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we focus our mind on. We have the mind of Christ. In this reading from Philippians, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Um, I just want to reread for you Paul's words, complete my joy by being of the same mind Okay, phreneo is this Greek word, okay? And uh, then this is interesting here. With the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. It's a really difficult phrase to translate into Greek. Thinking one thing. Uh, having the same attitude that is also in Christ Jesus. It's so hard. Paul's using this word phreneo, okay? And it's kind of like, I'm not good with uh, uh, different forms and things, but I think it's a good gerund. It's, a, it's a, from a, from a uh, verb, and it's like literally in Greek, have the same minding as Christ. And no one knows how to translate it. You look at parallel translations beside one another, and they all sound different. They're all trying different combinations of things to try to get at this, because literally it's like 
The same minding as Christ, what is that? Okay, mindfulness is what I want to argue for Neo. Very interesting. This is such an interesting little etymological detail in, con in the context of, uh, you know, Buddhist meditation and focusing on breathing. Guess what? Our diaphragm controls our breathing, right? And the Greek word for our diaphragm is phren, P-H-R-E-N. So phreneo is this thought that comes from in here. So it's cognitive, yeah, but it's also visceral, you know? It's kind of like the seed of our decision-making, our judgments, phrenesis, is what we translate as prudence, okay? Where we make prudent decisions, it's kind of like I think of a regulator on a car or an engine or something, okay? It's the regulator. Now, what happens when you take that regulator off or when the thing gets wild and out of control, you have phrenitis, okay? That's an inflammation of this friend, okay? This source of our, seat of our judgment. When we have phrenitis, uh, that's like a, um, a bad thing. It's like insanity. That's where we get the word frantic, frenzy. Uh, right now, wow. Does that apply to our situation or what? Okay, we are wild and out of control and people are just, I mean, we got so much going on right now between the election and now there's a Supreme Court justice vacant seat that has to be filled. That just turns the heat up on the burner in the midst of this COVID, people are rioting in the streets. All this adversity we're dealing with right now, people are so spun up and frantic and frenzied, freneo, okay, fren, frenitis. Uh, we have this inflammation of this um, freneo, this mind, all right? Now, the second son I want to mention, what made him change his mind, that second son in the gospel story, was the fact that he was listening, he was open, he was mindful of the voice of God within him to his conscience. These prostitutes and tax collectors, okay, they were mindful and they turned back to the Lord and did his will. They repented, they went out into the vineyard. So I love this idea of mindfulness. And how do we get this mindfulness? Let's get practical here for a second. Here's what I'm gonna recommend. People come to me anxious or depressed Sad. You know what I often tell them? It's counterintuitive, but helps me. So I'd bequeath it to you. Contemplate, reflect upon, meditate on your death. People are like, what? You tell a depressed person to meditate on their death? Yes. Okay, why would I say such a thing? Because it's a splash of cold water in the face. The instant we think about our death, immediately the implications... All the fundamental human questions are cl followed close behind. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What am I supposed to be doing in the meantime? What's the meaning of my death, of my life? Is there a God? All these questions flood our brain. Instant, you are faced with the reality of our death. Our Lord wants us to reflect on our death often. Not a day goes by I don't think about my death. Okay, it's a constant meditation. It isn't morbid. It's the finish line for us as Christians. And we're looking, uh, whenever the Lord calls us home, it's better. I, last week in the, uh, forget what passage it was in Paul, but he's like, look, it is good for me to be here with you, but uh, to me, life is Christ and death is gain. It's better for me to go to the Lord. But uh, for your sake, I'll stay here as long as he wants me to, but I can't wait to go home to the Lord. All right, that should be a Christian's attitude ultimately. Uh, that's what, uh, that's the finish line for us the goal to get, that we're striving to get to ultimately is to cross over into eternity and see the Lord to go home to our true homeland, all right? So thinking about our death, immediately we lift off of this world and become mindful. This is mindfulness for a Christian. We get up there high in the upper hemispheres with the Lord in that eagles are able to fly so high. I don't know of any bird that flies higher than an eagle, maybe a condor or something, I don't know. But I'll tell you, of all the birds I've ever seen, I've never seen a bird get as high as an eagle. 
I've watched them ride a thermal until I can't see them anymore. They're just a little pin dot in the sky and then they just disappear. I can't keep track of them up there. I don't see any other birds getting up that high. My brother's a Southwest pilot, been flying for years. He's like, man, it's the weirdest thing. You'll be making an approach to an airport. You're still thousands of feet up in the air. You look out the cockpit, and there's an eagle flying over there. Look, hey, tells the co-pilot, there he is cruising right underneath the wing. Unbelievable, these birds, just so majestic, soaring, flying like an eagle is a great expression. That's the Christian. When you look at our Lord in the Gospels, there's part of him that's always up there, flying, soaring above this thing. When we're stressed out and we have ruminating thoughts, we think of our death, we get up nice and high over top of all this and the cacophony of all this craziness down here starts to fade. We can have eagle eye vision too and peer down there. We're not like losing track of it. We see it, but we ride these thermals in contemplative prayer, prayer of presence with the Lord. That's what contemplation is, a simple prayer of union. We want to ride these thermals like an eagle. Think of our death and ride that thermal and get up high over this whole thing so you can see from horizon to horizon and you get your bearings. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm supposed to be doing in the meantime. I know who I am up here in the wind with the Lord above the earth with nothing but Oh, it's so healthy. You want to talk about Christian mindfulness? Do that every day, folks. Empty yourself and just focus on your awareness of the presence of the Lord. Think about your death and get way up high over the earth during these crazy times. Do it every day. It will help and bring your blood pressure down. Your doctor will be amazed. You will have meaning and purpose flow into your life. What makes people depressed? They feel despair. They feel a lack of meaning, purpose, hope. Meaning, purpose, hope flows into us. Sense of our mission, of our destiny. Brings me joy, these things. When I get to know who I am and what I'm doing, I have purpose. What comes behind that oftentimes is joy and peace. Peace and the abandonment of myself to the will of God. I'm telling you, Christian mindfulness is so superior to this emptying of oneself into this great nothing void or whatever. Um, um, it's a... It's a so anyway, something for you all to think about. This homily was supposed to be it's covering a lot of ground, but I want it to be practical, and I really want to encourage you to try contemplative prayer. Say the name of Jesus even. Breathe in on G and exhale on Zus. The name, as we just heard in Philippians chapter 2 here, which is above every other name. There is no name, St. Peter says in the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 3, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we are to be saved. The name of Jesus. Try praying with the Lord's very own name in your breathing and you will experience Christian mindfulness. <laughs>